My name is Michelle Williams. I'm 25 years old. I have a husband who is six years older than me. We've been married for two years now, and in both good and bad ways, our relationship hasn't changed. Even now, my husband often tells me, I love you. Although this straightforward expression of affection can be embarrassing, I'm honestly happy that he continues to say it. However, there are times when I wonder if he truly loves me. This is particularly the case when he prioritizes his parents over me. Before we got married, I wasn't too bothered by it. When he canceled our dates to prioritize his parents, I thought he's kind and is even a family-oriented person, and I was impressed. But that was because I thought his priorities would change after we got married. I never imagined them to remain the same even after marriage. I couldn't broach my concern to my husband or in-laws at this point, but I was truly upset when my husband went on a trip with his parents on our wedding anniversary. At first, he seemed to not understand why I was angry, but when he realized it was our anniversary, he apologized desperately with an oh-no expression. Although I had no intention of forgiving him immediately after hearing his desperate apology and the story that he took his parents on a trip to make up after a fight, I couldn't stay angry. However, some resentment remained deep inside my heart. At the same time, I began to have a less favorable impression of my in-laws. In particular, the times my husband got called over to my in-law's place increased, and my dissatisfaction with him and my in-laws piled up. If a similar situation ever occurs again, I decided to directly talk to my in-laws if my husband were to ever prioritize them over me on some kind of anniversary again. One Friday night, I ran into my older sister in town as I was rushing home from overtime work. We hadn't seen each other much since we both got married, so I was happy to see her, and we decided to go out for dinner, just the two of us. Out of courtesy, we both let our husbands know, and we headed to a nearby pub. Since both of us were off from work the next day, we decided to enjoy our meal in conversation with some drinks that we usually refrain from. After we finished talking about our recent happenings, Silence fell as I sipped my drink and thought about the next topic of conversation. My sister suddenly started chuckling. When I asked her what was wrong, she just said she remembered something funny. She didn't seem to want to talk more about it, but when I insisted, she reluctantly started speaking. You know the other day I saw someone who looked just like your husband. I was taken aback as I wasn't expecting that. As I urged her to continue, my sister said, Well, he was with a child so I knew right away that it wasn't him. But he looked so much like him that I did a double take, and because of that, I ran into a lamppost. She then lifted her bangs, and I could clearly see that her forehead was swollen. I drew attention from the people around me, and I was so embarrassed that I quickly ran away. I felt sorry for my sister, who was starting to complain while fixing her bangs, but I couldn't help but laugh at my reliable sister's mishap. I thought I'd tell my husband about the story I heard from my sister when I got home, but I completely forgot and fell asleep. Moreover, I fell ill the next day. I'd been laid down in bed, completely taken down by a dreadful combo of sore throat, chills, and fever. My symptoms, far from abating, only got worse, and I was contemplating whether or not to see a doctor when I heard some noise. When I went to check it, there was my husband, John, preparing to leave with his Boston bag in hand. I called out to his retreating back in panic, where are you going? John shrugged his shoulders and slowly turned around. Although I wish she would stay by my side given my poor health, he seemed oblivious to my feelings and said, I promise my parents to take them to a spa today. I'll be back later. With an unapologetic expression. I begged John, please don't go. Judging by his luggage, it seems he wouldn't return home today if he left. I thought that he would surely reconsider when he saw my current condition. But to my disappointment, he said the spot is booked and it would be a waste to cancel now. He left for a few minutes. After John left, I was in a daze. I felt as though I had been abandoned by my husband, but staying there wouldn't bring John back. I gave up and went to bed. In the middle of the night, I woke up suddenly and noticed that my body was abnormally hot. The fever, far from dropping, seemed to have risen even higher. I thought this was bad and wanted to take some medication, but I didn't even have the energy left to go and get medicine or a drink. Alarmed, I decided to call John to come back home. However, I received no response. He probably had his phone turned off. 
Frustrated with my husband, I then called my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law answered the phone immediately. I wanted to complain about everything so far, but I was at a loss for words when she asked, What's the matter? In my confusion, I asked my mother-in-law, Um, isn't John with you right now? She replied, No, he isn't here. Actually, I haven't seen my son for a while now. My mind went blank at my mother-in-law's words. My mother-in-law, sensing something was wrong due to my silence, kept calling my name. However, I was unable to respond to her and ended up hanging up the phone. Physically and mentally drained, I lost consciousness right then and there. I don't know how much time had passed. The first thing I saw when I opened my eyes was not John's face, but my mother-in-law's face peering into mine. Is that you, mother-in-law? I'm sorry, but I let myself in with a spare key. I shook my head at my mother-in-law's words. No, on the contrary, thank you. I could tell from her casual attire and lack of makeup that my mother-in-law had rushed over in a hurry. Although it was different from my usual impression of her, I felt glad. I accepted a glass of water from my mother-in-law and took a sip. My mother-in-law quietly waited for me to finish drinking, then asked, Do you think you can eat some jello? I nodded in response to my mother-in-law's words, ate the jello she handed me, and then swallowed some of the over-the-counter medication she had brought. As the medicine took effect and I began to feel a little better, tears started rolling down my cheeks. My sudden crying must have surprised my mother-in-law, but she waited patiently until I had finished. After a while, my tears stopped, and I began to feel embarrassed for having cried in front of my mother-in-law. I felt guilty for burdening her and bowed my head in apology, saying, I'm sorry for the trouble. When I apologized, my mother-in-law responded, It's all right, but where is my son when you're suffering like this? She remarked about my husband who was not present. I couldn't say anything and just looked down. However, my mother-in-law remained silent, patiently waiting for me to speak. Overwhelmed by the silence, I decided to tell her everything that's been going on. By the time I finished talking, my mother-in-law's face had turned into a stern one. And then, in a voice so low it was almost inaudible, she said, I never made such a promise and I never heard of it. She even called my father-in-law on the spot to confirm. My father-in-law also confirmed that he hadn't had such a conversation with my husband. So where and with whom was my husband right now? Suddenly, I recalled a joke my sister had once told. Could it be that story? No, but surely unconsciously my words slipped out, and my mother-in-law did not miss them. She asked, Do you know something? Caught off guard, I stammered, No, I... But my mother-in-law was clear. I won't tolerate wrong actions for my son just because he's my son. It might be hard for you, but please tell me. Looking into her eyes, I realized I couldn't evade her question. Moreover, at that moment, I trusted my mother-in-law more than my husband. Reflecting on it, I realized that my impression and my in-laws had only been shaped through my husband, not from my own interactions with them. I gathered my courage and told my mother-in-law the story I'd heard from my sister and about the frustrations I had been feeling. As a result, I learned that most of the things my husband had been telling me about his parents were lies I became unable to forgive my husband. In many ways, looking at my mother-in-law, I realized she felt the same way. A few weeks after, I fell ill. One weekend, my husband said, I'm going to my parents, might stay overnight inside, I thought, so the day has finally come. But hourly, I saw him off with the indifferent face as usual. After he left, I picked up my phone and called my mother-in-law. The next day, my unsuspecting husband returned as usual. I brought some souvenirs, man. My mom just wouldn't let me leave. I could hear my carefree husband's voice from the front door. His footsteps gradually approached, and the living room door opened. The moment he entered the living room, Welcome back. By the way, who is this mom you're talking about? It was not me, but my mother-in-law who spoke. Seeing his mother's face, my husband froze. Without waiting for a response, my mother-in-law approached my husband with a smile and said, I thought for sure you were the child I bore with such pain, but maybe I was mistaken. What? Uh, wait a minute. Why is mom here? My husband was muttering in a trembling voice, looking back and forth between me and my mother-in-law. Realizing that his father was also present, my husband finally seemed to grasp the situation. But by that point, 
it was too late. My mother-in-law, not waiting for any response, pointed to a chair and directed my husband to sit. He sat down quietly, surrounded by me, my mother-in-law, and my father-in-law. My husband looked visibly uncomfortable. Urged by my mother-in-law, I took out some documents from an envelope. Concerned with my visibly frightened husband, I laid out the documents I had obtained from the private investigator in front of him. These, I said, are all evidence of your infidelity. My husband looked at me desperately after losing his words. However, looking at my husband didn't stir any feelings in me. Without revealing any of my inner relief, I told him, your mistress should be receiving a certified letter detailing everything soon. Upon hearing that, my husband stood up and yelled in panic, please don't do that. She has a child. Surprised at my husband's statement, I asked, so that's none of my business? If you felt sorry for the child, why didn't you break up with me before starting a relationship with her? My husband opened his mouth, but he was unable to find any excuses and sat back down. I had learned from the private investigator that my husband's mistress was a single mother and her child's father was unknown. Whether my husband knew this or not, I didn't know. Eventually, my husband managed to squeeze out the words, They have no one but me. I can't abandon her and her child, but I truly love you and care about you. His words were incomprehensible, yet he spoke with a serious look. Sp Hearing my husband's words, I was overwhelmed with disbelief. I was supposed to have fallen in love with his kindness, but looking at him now, all our past memories seemed like nothing more than illusions. My parents-in-law were also looking at my husband with astonishment. I caught my mother-in-law's eye and shook my head. She returned a tired, apologetic nod. I could tell my husband was desperate to mend things, but I had no intention of forgiving him. In fact, after hearing his words, I wanted to cut off my ties with him right away. Ignoring my still-talking husband, I handed him the divorce papers. Let's get a divorce. When I said that, my husband looked at the divorce papers, then at me, and asked in surprise, Why? Why? Because, I responded, this incident has brought my feelings and trust in you down to zero. Let me be clear, it is impossible for me to continue our marriage. We will decide on the details through our lawyers. I firmly told my husband, but he shook his heed and said, No, I can't. I was filled with disbelief and anger at my husband's attitude. My mother-in-law seemed to feel the same, and she called my husband's name in a suppressed tone. Looking at my mother-in-law, she was looking at my husband with contempt and said, You have no right to refuse. This is your doing. We are in favor of the divorce. In fact, it was me who recommended Michelle get a divorce. You have really done something terrible. Reflect on your actions and work hard to pay alimony. After being yelled at by his mother, my husband signed the divorce papers while sobbing. After our divorce, it seems my ex-husband John spent some time crying his heart out at his parents' home. However, after a few weeks, he appeared to settle down, and then he apparently told his parents he was going to remarry, this time with the woman he had an affair with. His parents were livid when they heard this, especially his father, who was so angry that he told John he would disown him if he married the woman he had an affair with and effectively kicked him out of the house. Now homeless, John apparently tried to move into the woman's home. However, whether she woke up to his unreliability or gave up on him after he became jobless post-divorce, the woman he had an affair with seemed to have kicked him out. You might wonder how I know all these details. It's because John himself reported it to me, starting with messages making himself out to be the victim of a tragedy. The victim. He eventually sent me a cryptic message saying, She didn't need me. I was duped. I only have you now. I didn't reply to that message, but instead forwarded it to my lawyer and changed my phone number. Sometime later, I received an apology letter from John's mother via my lawyer. The letter began with an apology and stated that to avoid causing any more trouble, they had decided to make John work under supervision at a company run by relatives. Since then, my days have been peaceful. Right now, I'm living at my parents' home, but I'm planning to start living alone soon. My parents told me that I can stay as long as I need to, but I want to move out as soon as possible so as not to cause them any more worry. My sister Sarah tends to come home frequently when I'm around, worrying about me. In the time following my divorce, there were days when I felt mentally unstable, but I have since gained stability thanks to my family. I believe that in the not-so-distant future, 
I will be able to move out and start on a new path. 